to those of you who are joining us again, welcome back. And to those of you who are new, welcome. This series has been going on since I think September of 2023, but we also held this series in 2022, where we dug a little bit further into the diagnostic criteria and those comorbid conditions. So if you're looking to dig into that a little bit more, you can do so either on the Bateman Horn Center's repository or the University of Utah's. So today I'm looking forward to a wonderful presentation by Dr. Azola and Dr. Melanie Hoppers. They will be talking about pediatric and young adult long COVID. This is one of those areas where I feel like we never know enough, right? And it's one of those in a population that we're constantly feeling unsure how to help them the most. And so I'm really, really thankful for both of their time. Dr. Azola. I am so grateful for the invitation and excited to, to be in this group sharing about long COVID and in particularly about the young adult population. I came across the long COVID MECFS world through being voluntold the task to open the long COVID clinic for outpatient care early, early in the pandemic. And I have kind of grown to learn from the people that have been working in this group of patients for decades. Uh, I saw the name Amy Mooney and it made my heart smile because she was one of those people that was really eager to, to share and to really help us understand how to manage these patients when we weren't trained to do that. But anyway, today I'm gonna talk about young adults and next slide, I have no disclosures. And next slide, I'm going to mainly talk about an overview of recent epidemiological data on long COVID in, this, in the young pediatric population that came out of the CDC. I'm also going to talk about special considerations when we are creating a plan and assessing a young adult with long COVID. And I'm going to present a case of a young woman with long COVID and to kind of highlight certain important points that, that can come up. Through the, through the history of caring for this chronically ill patient. So next slide, well, the terminology. I'm sure that you guys have gone over this before, but I always like to clarify long COVID, patient defined term, broad, inclusive, new symptoms after COVID. Post COVID conditions has a Delphi process um, definition that defines it as new symptoms that start three months from the onset of infection and that last two months uh, or longer and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. And other terms that are used kind of interchangeably at this point, post-acute sequela SARS-CoV-2 and long COVID. Next slide. Uh, in terms of, of the most recent epidemiologic data, a few months back, the CDC published their pediatric data looking at the different ages and sex and race. In this slide, we can see the people that report ever having long COVID, right? So like incidents and and then the current population with long COVID. And we can see that it affects mostly the older, that age group between 12 and 17 years are most often affected. But there is some, you know, zero to five and six to 11 year olds. And the difference between the ever having COVID and, and current long COVID, you know, I, I feel like it's dangerous to interpret it as, as people getting better, but it could be kind of the fluctuant nature of the course that could explain some of that difference. This one has the information on adults, again, where we saw a small decrease on the prevalence of long COVID, but there's still a significant group when you look at the comparison for the older ages, for example. So that 30 up to like 50 is, is the ages that are most predominantly affected. Next slide. Risk factors in particular for the young population, female sex at birth, which is consistent with a lot of what has been published to date. Older than 10 years tends to be a risk factor. Hispanic ethnicity appears to be a risk factor. Comorbid, and this is interesting because typically the Hispanic community has less access to care and barriers to, to obtain care for long COVID. So I think it's particularly interesting to, to see that at the population at large, this population of Hispanics patients have a higher risk of having lingering symptoms. Other comorbid conditions include allergy, asthma, 
obesity, anxiety, heart disease, and neurologic disorders, reinfection is, is associated to um, higher risk of long COVID symptoms, specifically in the adult data. So when we're encountering this population that presents with debilitating symptoms after COVID, it's important to assess what's the functional impact. What are those activities that are basic activities from day to day? Schooling, vocational, extracurriculars, all of those activities are going to be impacted. So we really want to get a gauge on the degree of impairment in each of those activities. And we want to also triage the symptoms from most debilitated to kind of prioritize those, but also kind of highlight which ones are the most treatable symptoms, right? Because certain certain symptoms are amenable to, to medical management and, and we know we can potentially make more of an impact. So we want to kind of see what's important to them, what are the most debilitating and what we can gain some ground on with a treatment. And if needed, you know, from a general medicine or pediatrics point of view, you may need to do some subspecialty referrals. But I want to highlight that in the treatment of long COVID, subspecialty referrals can actually fragment care to a certain degree. So it's important to be able to create a plan where you're not going to be able to solve all of the complaints that they present with. But you know, create a plan with the patient when you're triaging, kind of making priority of some symptoms and slowly work on them because sometimes that we see has a better outcome overall because they have more continuity of care and less fragmentation of care. Of course, there are times when referral is needed and and patient driven. I mean, what really matters to the patient, you know, and the patient doesn't care if their heart rate dropped 10 points, you know, they care about feeling better, right? So, you know, are they able to do their practice? Are they able to do volleyball or whatever it is that they're trying to achieve? So it's important to always come back to what what really matters to them. Next slide. Accommodations can be a very helpful thing that medic practitioners can do for long COVID young adults and adolescents. For example, if we can get them permission for a later start in the day, as some patients may find the morning hours more difficult than the afternoon hours. Flexibility in the assignments of due dates, more flexible schedules so that they can fit in those windows when they're able to be more functional, right? And be able to, to meet deadlines without a strict date that will sometimes throw them into PEM, extended time for tasks, ability to take breaks, sometimes ability to, to be positioned with the legs elevated during the, the test taking time, flexibility to use water, which is actually, you know, an issue in a lot of schools where they don't allow access to, you know, carrying water, and flexibility to make up assignments and, and absences as well. Next slide. It's important that these patients feel validated. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but patients have been potentially seen by multiple other providers or even their family or their, their friends. They look okay, so they don't understand that the symptoms are so debilitating. So it's very important to create a an environment that the patient feels safe about talking about their symptoms. That's like the most therapeutic thing we can do is allow the patients to feel comfortable and then assist with navigating the healthcare system. The healthcare system is complex. There's a lot of barriers and unfortunate insurance issues. And also it's important for the, the physicians to, to play a role in helping them navigate that system. Referrals to psychotherapy are important. And these are something that can be sensitive for some patients. We don't want to emphasize, you know, that these symptoms that they're experiencing are due to depression, right? We want to make sure that they that they understand that this is a debilitating disease process that they're living with. And we need to assist them with coping strategies so that they can manage and navigate this this new sense of self. And I usually tell them as a physiatrist, this is like having a stroke or like having a traumatic brain injury or a spinal cord injury where, you know, now you're not able to do things that you were able to do before. And, and everybody needs assistance in order to be able to cope with living in this new self, right? 
loss of function and decreased quality of life contributes to, to depression and anxiety and exacerbation of, of pre-existing men mental health conditions. So it is important. It is a su subject that needs to be addressed, but has to be approached with the understanding that this is part of them learning how to cope with a new illness. Next slide. I wanted to talk about one of my favorite patients. We all have favorites. This is a 23-year-old female. Um, she had just become a nurse practitioner, um, had a past medical history of Hashimoto's, celiac disease, um, anxiety. She was on Soloft, had some exacerbation of asthma intermittently that had COVID infection in December of 2020. He had five days of, you know, body aches, headaches, nausea, all of that, generalized malaise, typical of acute COVID. But at day seven, she felt like she was getting better. And she decided to go back to work remotely. And when she sat in her computer, she couldn't navigate the computer system that she was very familiar with. She couldn't find where the things were, how to get, how to navigate that. So basically she was like, I cannot do this. Maybe I need a little bit more rest. She took some time off the rest of the of the Christmas break. And 17 days after the initial infection, she was feeling pretty good. There was a snowstorm. She decided to shovel some snow in the driveway and clean up. Next slide. That exertion after shoveling triggered a severe onset, acute onset of shortness of breath, chest pain, fatigue. She was unable to get out of bed for several days. She had fluctuating symptoms throughout the first few months, and she was kind of fluctuating between 30 to 50 percent of her baseline. Um, the, the triggers that brought on her symptoms were physical activity, even typical ADLs like dressing, undressing, bathing, lightheaded, and they brought on lightheadedness, palpitations, very fast heart rate to 140s and chest tightness, sweating, flushing, altered vision, diarrhea, bloating, the laundry list of broad multisystemic complaints that we see in long COVID. But she also had a noted an ex a flare of her eczema, and some worsening pruritus, which I thought was interesting to note. On exam, she was not able to tolerate more than one minute standing. She became presyncopal immediately after standing. I called her husband and got her to pick, pick her up at the office because I didn't want her to drive home. One of the things that you can see on physical exam as well is important to know that not only we're looking for those changes in heart rate and blood pressure, but we're also looking for physical symptoms and signs that can be reproduced with the standing test, right? And typically we want to try to keep them standing for about 10 minutes. We, um, I, in my practice, I usually do five minutes laying down, 10 minutes standing, and then two minutes laying down. The, the second numbers when you're laying down, actually, we find that it helps us get a lower nadir, uh, sometimes before the 10 minute stand test, the, per the person is a little bit more stressed and the heart rate tends to be higher. So that's just a little, a little pearl there. And in terms of physical symptoms, one of the most obvious ones we see is the acrocyanosis of this like blood pooling, mainly due to the autonomic dysfunction. And we also can see a uh, very slow capillary refill. Um, so that's something that you can note. Usually it's like longer than three seconds when you try to do cap refill when they're standing. Next slide. They also get nauseous. And I was going to mention that in terms of the acrocyanosis, in people of color, it's harder to see. It's not as obvious because of the, the melatonin, the melanin in their skin. So I I often check the sole of the feet, and you can see in this picture how in the kind of the the lower leg you don't see that big of a difference, but when you look at the sole of the feet, you really see kind of the acrocyanosis. So for the initial workup, you know. I think that this has probably been discussed in this forum before, but, you know, we want to make sure that we check for all those treatable causes of fatigue. And in her case, because of this exacerbation of her pre-existing eczema and itching, I also added some markers for mast cell. Um, she did have an elevated histamine and a normal tryptase. This doesn't necessarily mean 
um, if they are negative, it doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not positive for mast cell, but it, it can kind of help sustain, support the diagnosis. So I always do send them usually one uh, for baseline and then another order for them to get in the episode that they have a flare in symptoms. That way it's it's easier to catch that. We wanted to do you know the proper cardiac workup, just AKG, halter, and echo to make sure that there was no structural abnormality or no arrhythmia. And she had a tilt table. We're lucky enough to have it. It doesn't absolutely need to be done in order to diagnose POTS or autonomic dysfunction or neurally mediated hypotension. But that's another topic. But in this case, we were able to get one and it was positive for POTS. And we also did a cutaneous nerve biopsy looking for small fiber neuropathy and pseudomotor degeneration. And in her case, it was negative. I find that it sometimes is negative initially. And after a year from onset of, of illness, sometimes you repeat the biopsy and it comes back positive. So now I like to wait a little bit before I order the skin biopsy just to make sure that, that we're going to capture it. So on the bottom is a strip of her CO patch, which I, I've i learned that it has this like beautiful output that they send back. And, you know, so you're making sure that they don't have arrhythmias, but you're also looking at kind of their diurnal cycle and you can see when they have you know kind of what time of the day they're more up and going and then that can help determine which time to dose the middle drain for example and things like that so I find looking at the CO patch um, output uh, to be helpful this is kind of a little bit beyond the scope of this talk but you guys can have the slides just a little bit on the approach non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic approach to the treatment of orthostatic intolerance in these patients. And again, it's it's important to note that these patients do respond to autonomic rehabilitation with the proper providers that understand autonomic rehabilitation and how to advance it. Recumbent exercises are always helpful, but it's really important that the providers that are treating these patients not only understand POTS, but also understand that a lot of the patients with long COVID have post-exertional malaise. Non-pharmacologic interventions were started with her. We just increased hydration, salt, compression, and she was improving in terms of her standing tolerance and her activity tolerance. So I signed her up for PT with our POTS PT team, and she was following up with me about three months after. And I didn't hear anything until she came to follow up in clinic and she was in a wheelchair. So it's really important that the patients are educated. Again, this is worth highlighting constantly that if you start rehabilitation and they start noticing episodes of post-exertional malaise, this is not the goal of PT. The goal of PT is not just going to PT you know, using all your spoons and then crashing for two days. So this is when I called Amy Mooney to help me. But all jokes aside, it, it's, it was, you know, something that really helped me kind of hone it in. And I know that probably a lot of you here understand this concept, but at the larger community, it's not more is more with this patient population. So we stopped physical therapy and she had completely declined. She couldn't tolerate short household distances and walking. She needed assistance from her partner for all ADLs. We increased titrate up the plan and we added IV fluids. We added IV fluids three times a week. We tried Floranef, didn't tolerate it. I find that some patients have mood issues, in some cases, even suicidal ideation. And this is something that I haven't found anything published on, but there's been a lot of anecdotal stories that we share in, in our practice. So it's it's something to be on the lookout for. Uh, Mestinon, she could not tolerate it because of the GI side effects and bronchospasms. And ibabradine was good for her. So she she was, we were able to get some better rate control with that. And, and we bumped up her midodrin. And for her MCAS, we kind of upped, uh, increase adding Monteluca, Sizal, and quercetin. Next slide. Then she had a reinfection in November of 2021. 
And he received monoclonal antibodies at that point because they were still effective against the variants then. But she did have a bad exacerbation of her POT symptoms. So we had to get bump up the IV fluids. She had an exacerbation of her brain fog. We started LDN that helped a little bit. Modafinil and methylphenidate were trial, but it really kind of elevated her blood, her heart rate. So she couldn't tolerate those. And she had a bad exacerbation of her MCAS. We got more strict with the management, gluten-free diet, gastrochrome, double dosing the H1, H2, nasochrome. But she continued to have a functional decline. And this is her. Actually, she was featured in a Washington Post article about disability and long COVID. Yeah, it's one of the cases that kind of made me really want to be part of treating this patient population because it's devastating for sure. The Then in September of 23, she was doing a little bit better, but then had this episode of anaphylaxis, kind of completely new onset. She was eating halibut with some mango. We're not sure exactly what triggered it, but she's had it in the past and she had to do three EpiPens had to go to the emergency room, was admitted overnight, and really took a while for her to to recover. Um, she's doing better now. I saw her before the Christmas break, and she's, you know, back again to being able to ambulate household distances. And, you know, she's definitely not bed bound at this moment. And she is starting solar next week. So we're excited, hoping that that will also help get her more functional. So that's pretty much all I have. Um, here are some kind of points that are important. Using the 10-minute passive stand test is key. So if you suspect past diagnosis in adolescents that present with multi-system complaints and positive review of system, it's important to, to take a moment and consider long COVID in the differential. It's important to screen for orthostatic intolerance. It's key to um, screen for post-exertional malaise, initiate tr the treatment, and that can be done in the primary care setting. All right, that's it. Okay, now, Dr. Hoppers, we're gonna get your slides up here. Dr. Azola, there are a couple questions in the chat. I just wanna make you aware of them and we will try to get to Q&A here. How's that look? Perfect. We're good? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Hoppers. Okay, so that was so great, and <laughs> I so enjoyed that, and I, I'm going to kind of go through mine a little more quickly because a lot of the same thing, I don't want to repeat things, and that'll give us more time for questions, if that's okay, but so I'm, I'm internal medicine and pediatrics, and so I see both adults and kids. Next slide. And I have the following disclosures and will not be discussing either of these today. Um, one additional thing, I learned how to make QR codes last week. And so I have QR codes all through this talk. And if you want to be prepared to download them, there are several good publications that you might be interested in. And you can also get them on the slides when they post them on the website. So next slide. So um, my first patient is a 14-year-old female who was previously healthy except for seasonal allergies. Uh, she was in the ninth grade taking college honors or college prep classes and prior to her illness was involved in several after school activities. So this is, is an active patient, a good student, um, et cetera. Um, next slide. Her first COVID infection was in August of 2020 and she just had mild respiratory symptoms. She recovered and returned to normal activities in under a week. Next slide. Over the next six weeks, she developed fatigue, missing school about once every two weeks, which was very unusual for her. She was taking naps after school and sleeping a lot on the weekends. She had headaches five days per week, whereas before she had only the occasional headache. She noticed that her schoolwork had suffered and felt that her memory and attention had become poor. She had insomnia at, at night despite feeling exhausted and was difficult to arouse in the morning and then sleepy during the day. She stated that on the weekends, she felt exhausted. She frequently had sore throat, swollen glands, aching muscles, just overall felt bad. She had also noticed that if she pushed to get herself through something like exam week, then she would have several days following that where she just really couldn't do anything but go to bed. 
Next slide. So this continued until January of 2021 when she again was infected with COVID-19. She again had upper respiratory symptoms in addition to fevers, myalgias, chills, and this time she developed a rash. Um, the rash was described as small red bumps with clear fluid-filled blisters that itched and burned. The acute symptoms lasted for about a week, but she never returned to her previously lowered baseline. Next slide. All of her previous symptoms of long COVID seemed to get worse, but in addition, she developed new symptoms of GI issues with constipation, bloating, and diarrhea. She also was easily irritated, had light and sound sensitivity, and frequently felt overwhelmed and anxious at school. And this was a totally new experience for her. The rash that she developed during the infection, the acute infection, continued to recur, and she said that she had it probably every couple of weeks, and occasionally it was associated with angioedema of the lips. She went and saw dermatology and was prescribed an EpiPen at that time, and it was at this point that she was referred to me. Next slide. On physical exam, she had dramatographia, flushing of face and neck, capillary refill was four to five seconds, and her Biton score was five. Next slide. I did all the typical labs that we do for fatigue, looking for other issues, and also MCAS labs. I know somebody had some questions on the MCAS labs, and they are difficult to get positive. And a lot of that is just incorrect collection. And so, you know, if you, there's a, there's going to be a QR code at the end where you can download an MCAS publication that goes through how to properly collect those labs. But if, if everyone isn't educated, you know, the person giving the containers and such to like for the urine to the patient, if they aren't instructed correctly, then you're not going to get a positive lab. So, and then if someone, once they've received the labs, if they aren't processed correctly, you won't get a positive lab. So some, sometimes those are difficult. Um, so anyway, she had labs, they were all normal. An echo was done and that was normal. We also ordered an event monitor. It was normal, but only worn for one day due to the development of urticaria and lip swelling after the electrodes were placed over the next day. Next slide. So this, the first QR code is actually a um, consensus statement on long COVID and autonomic dysfunction, of which Dr. Ozola is an author. And then also is the Nasaline test is the second QR code that you can download if you would like to get this form and the directions on how to do the test. Next slide. So the patient had symptoms of orthostatic intolerance by history. Also, when we did the lean test, she became symptomatic. Really, at the first minute, she became very dizzy. Um, we stopped the test at the sixth minute because she was just feeling so poorly. Her heart rate increased by 61 beats per minute without a commensurate drop in blood pressure. And her symptoms have been going on longer than six months. So she did meet the diagnostic criteria for POTS in the pediatric setting. Next slide. So additionally, this patient also, I say she has evidence of MCAS. To me, she screams MCAS, actually. She has a prior history of allergies. Um, she has developed urticaria. As you can see on this left picture was what happened when she had the event monitor on. I don't have a picture of her lips, but she did have swelling of that as well. She had recurrent episodes of angioedema and this recurrent rash that had been happening. She had GI issues, flushing, and POTS. The arm over here, the picture of the arm is actually, that was that recurrent rash that she had. Next slide. The patient also meets diagnostic criteria for MECFS using the Institute of Medicine 2015 criteria. Next slide. So I'll echo what Dr. Zola said that, you know, I, I'd like to break it down into what are the kind of the low-hanging fruit. Um, what can I do to make the patient feel better, you know, as quickly as possible? There's so many symptoms, you can't make them well or make them well quickly or make them, you know, it's hard to improve everything. But if you can get a couple of things and focus on that and try to work on that and make some differences, I think that's really important. The first thing that I do, especially with kids, is I want to talk about what's going on with them kind of explain it to them. I do a lot of educating. I talk about post-exertional malaise at the first visit. I want to define it and let them know about pacing and let them know it's okay to not push to do things because so many times both parents and sometimes even the kid think I've got to go to school. You know, I, I can't miss a day. I've got to get this assignment in and they sacrifice their health trying to push to get through things. So I want to kind of give them quote permission not to have to do those things. 
Also, I, I start with the school accommodations letter and I also ask them kind of what they need when we do that letter, because a lot of times they, you know, they can tell me things that are going on at the school that just, just help me get what they need in the letter. I also thought with this patient, her POTS and her MCAS were driving a lot of her symptoms. So it just started simple. I started her on Claritin, Pepsid, asked her to kind of keep a diary and try to figure out what were the precipitating factors for her rash, her GI symptoms. Also, for her POTS, did the typical conservative measures, the fluids, the head of the bed elevated, um, compression, you know, et cetera, and also started her on Metadrine. Now, in what I do with kids, it, it's it's a fine line because what ideally, if we lived in an ideal world, I might start one medicine at a time, give it a month, see if it's helping, you know, if something happens, we know what caused it, but we don't really have, I don't feel like we have that kind of time so, but I do start one medicine at a time, and I also kind of start with low doses, and low doses not meaning in comparison to other kids for the same problem if they did not have long COVID. I just find that they're more sensitive to medications, and I kind of go low and slow, and that's from experience. So, at the return visit, this patient reported much improvement of the headaches. She had resolution of her GI symptoms. She, she had not had a rash for six weeks. I think it was like eight weeks after I had seen her the first time. She still had some tachycardia and orthostatic symptoms. So it was improved, but not controlled. But she did state that her anxiety was resolved. So at that time, I increased her metadrine to five milligrams, and I haven't actually seen her in return yet. So I presented her first because I wanted to show you how, you know, some patients are really, even with long COVID, they're, they're pretty simple. I shouldn't say simple and straightforward, but for a long COVID patient, she was kind of a nice package with a bow on it as far as taking care of her. And then I want to present this next patient, if you can go to the next slide. And first, this is one of the tools for practitioners. This is the pediatric primer, and it's a great resource that I use a lot when I'm seeing kids. Um, and then the next slide, this is a template for the letter to the school. Oh, before I tell you about my other patient, I'll, I forgot I had this one coming up. So special considerations for pediatric patients. Next slide. Again, the, what I, the principles I apply to kids are really the same as adults, just sometimes it's a little more challenging. Again, education is important and focusing that education on to the, to the kid, to the family, to the extended family, you know, to grandparents, to the school, extracurricular people that they're involved with. It, as best I can, I try to extend that education out Post-exertional malaise can be a really difficult concept in the pediatric patient. I mean, it's difficult in an adult, right? But kids, it's even more complicated. They're still learning about consequences for not doing their homework. And, you know, it's hard. They don't necessarily understand what's going on with their body. Everything's changing already. And then you add this on top of things and it can be very confusing. The next thing is you have to also teach the concept to a parent who has varying levels of control over the patient. So, you know, if you're, you have a 10 year old, then that parent really controls a lot of what the patient does. You know, kid says, I'm too tired to go to school. And if the parent doesn't understand post-exertional malaise, the kid goes to school and the kid gets pushed into post-exertional malaise. So you really need to try to educate the parent and it can be challenging. You know, it's challenging enough to try to interpret your own energy envelope, much less trying to help someone gauge their energy envelope when you aren't getting that feed, that physical feedback. So education, education, education. And the thing I always think about too is when I'm at a visit, when we go through this long visit of them telling me everything that's going on and we go every go over everything and then I try to educate them, they're kind of tired at that point and, I'm, and it's hard. I, I don't want to overwhelm them. I don't want them to be in PEM because they came and saw me. So I, I try to give them resources to take home where they can use and, and look at on their energy, on their energy schedule, so to speak. Also, if you can find assistance with OT and PT, just it's really, really, really important that you get someone who understands post-exertional malaise and doesn't do harm. And there's lots of videos on the Bateman Horn website of OT and PT. And I, if you, I have my email. If anybody wants to email me, I can share some resources of people who do some things with telehealth and things like that that are immensely helpful. Next slide. The other thing that I do with, with kids is I try to see them pretty often, especially at the beginning. Again, things can change quickly. 
I think they need that support just to understand again, what's going on to feel like they're, you know, not abandoned. If they have questions, then they are there frequently to be able to ask those questions. I also try to make the visits the least energy consuming as possible. I do this with adults, of course, but if possible, schedule, I schedule these patients later in the day. I try to avoid wait times if possible. I, I have a buffer between my patients, so I don't usually have a wait time. I know everyone can't do that, but even having the parent come in and check in and the patient can wait in the car with a beeper or cell phone or something like that. Also, I try to speak in low tones and use a calm demeanor when I'm talking to them. Um, I have a lamp in the exam room so I can turn off the overhead lights when we're just talking. Just I, And part of that is one, to conserve their energy while they're at the visit, but two, I want to model the behavior that I want them to think about. So it shows them that I mean what I say when I talk about pacing. Next slide. So this is the, the second patient I wanted to talk about. So the first one was when I first started seeing long COVID patients, ME-CFS, that's the kind of patient I wanted because I wanted to start slow and easy and work my way into it. But unfortunately, that's not what happens. And you see more likely a patient like this. And I, I bring her up because even though she looks really, really complicated, at the end, it didn't take a lot to really impact her life. And I just, I, if anybody is watching these videos and haven't started seeing patients, I really want to encourage you to do so because there is a real just deficit of people who see pediatric patients with ME-CFS and long COVID, and these patients just get left behind. And I really would encourage you to try to see them if, if you can if you can do that. Anyway, so this patient is a 17-year-old female, and she developed COVID in May of 2023, and she has past medical history of allergies, eczema, dysmenorrhea, and depressive disorder. She developed symptoms of syncope and associated tonic-clonic movements for one month after her COVID infection. She had episodes up to 20 times a day. She had received evaluations at two pediatric hospitals and had been diagnosed with POTS and psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. She also had symptoms of fatigue, headaches, insomnia, constipation, diarrhea, urinary urgency. She had large swings in blood pressure and heart rate reported by grandmother who monitored those and worsening of her eczema. Next slide. This is a video. We can see if you can do it. I don't really want to turn the sound up, but and I think I had it down. But these, this is an example of the episodes that were happening. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide because it just continues. So grandma sent me that video along with a big stack of records. And that was where I kind of wanted to tap out and send her somewhere, but there was nowhere to send her. So if I didn't see her, no one was going to. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Anyway, with her, I kind of wanted to get a feel for what was going on. I felt like she had some MCAS issues. And so I, I started her on Claritin and Pepsid um, for the MCAS. And then she had been diagnosed with POTS and I, she was not being treated or had not, she had been given conservative measures and she was doing that. But I wanted to start her on propranolol. Again, I started low dose, five milligrams, three times a day. And I kind of wanted to give my give myself time to wrap my brain around her, look through her records and really understand what was going on. So um, I had her come back in a month. And at that time, she had dramatic improvement of her eczema and GI symptoms. And her eczema had been, you know, as long as she can remember. And then it got worse with COVID. But she said it's the first time she could ever remember having clear skin. And again, like I said, the GI symptoms were better as well. Now, the syncopal episodes and non-epileptiform episodes were unchanged. She was coming to the clinic in a, in a wheelchair at this point. She was such a fall risk that she just, she was in a wheelchair. So she was very severely affected by these episodes. So seeing that the Claritin and Peps had seemed to have done something with the eczema and the GI symptoms, I thought, well, MCAS is a good target. Again, I'm still kind of nervous with her. And I thought, well, I'm going to try some gastrochrome. I also added glutocortisone with the warning about depression. She does have a history of depression. I told them if there's any worsening at all, they have my email. My patients have my email, especially at the beginning. I do that because that's how I've learned. A, a lot of the things I've learned has come from close contact with my patients. I do something, they tell me what happens. And so now I kind of, I've learned from that. So that's been really helpful. It's very exhausting, but it is helpful. So anyway, added the glutocortisone. I also added IV fluids three times a week for three weeks and had her come back in a month. So at this time, when she came back in, her 
Pods had minimal, some improvement. She was still dizzy, still kind of presyncopal, but she was fainting and she, there were no more epileptic episodes or non-epileptiform episodes. Um, I don't like the word psychogenic seizures. I don't know why that really bothers me. I can't say that, but non-epileptic episodes stopped one week after initiation of the gastrocomp. She walked into the clinic and smiling, happy, able to go places without you know, doing these episodes and hitting her head and et cetera. No one was able to get IV access as outpatient. She was still struggling to get oral fluids and salt. And so I thought, well, I'll fine tune her pots and order to pick line. And the day after the pick line was placed, she started her episodes again. Now, funny thing, even though I just told you that I asked these patients to contact me, and sometimes that this patient's raised by her grandmother, sometimes grandmother emails me daily, which is fine, but she didn't email me when this started happening. So this kind of went on for about a month, but she developed the episodes to the point one day she fell, busted her head open, had to go to the ER and get lac repair. She developed hematuria. Urgency frequency went to the ER for that. She They did urine, sterile urine, culture negative. She developed the rash. And that's about the time I think that they called me was when this rash developed. And there's a picture of it there. Her GI symptoms had reappeared. And at that point, I thought, well, this is MCAS rearing its ugly head and it's not doing her any good. So we, we recommended removal of the PICC line. Next slide. Also started Benadryl at that time, just to add on. And within just a few days, the episodes decreased in frequency and gradually stopped over about a week. At a month, she had had zero episodes. Now, since this time, and I, there's a lot of things we've done with her, and that would take another hour or two. So I, I just kind of wanted to get this main point across. But it, she still has them occasionally, but she can usually pick out the trigger. You know, one day she went to eat at a, a Chinese restaurant and she... Uh, had several episodes for a couple of days after that, but you know, again, it's, it's kind of exposure related, but the point of this patient, like I said, is that even though she looked really, really complicated, we I broke it down into a couple of things and some very simple things actually helped. And, you know, it made a difference for her. And so, it, and I wouldn't know how to do this if I weren't listening to these echoes and gaining this knowledge. So I'm really grateful for these echo lectures. But anyway, so that's what we did with her. And next slide. This is another one of those great publications. It's kind of the MCAS Bible from Dr. Afrin. And so that's a good resource to have as well. And there's some good information on how to check MCAS labs correctly. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent lectures. Thank you, Dr. Zola and Dr. Hoppers. We've had quite a bit of chatter in the, the chat box here. Dr. Zola, I see that you've responded to a few of those. Would you mind just kind of summarizing some of the, the takeaways? Sure. So the first question was regarding the IV fluids. Wait. Oh, the patch. The first question was about the patch that I highlighted. So it, it's called a Zeo patch. It's just the brand name, but it's a halter. I usually do them for at least two weeks. Um, and sometimes, yeah, the people have sensitivities to, to the skin or they have hyperhidrosis and they can't wear it the whole time. But, you know, if you can get that information, that's really helpful. And the... MCAS diagnosis being confirmed through testing. I think we kind of touched on that. And, and I think the reference with the Afrin paper is great for that. But yeah, testing is tricky. The, the half-life of some of these mediators like histamine um, and tryptase is not very long. So they, they're only present for a brief moment. So it's hard to catch it. Plus it's hard to um, have a lab that properly maneuvers them. And the increase in ferritin, no, actually her ferritin was pretty low. I actually went back to the chart and checked. It was about 30. Um, and the evidence for the IV fluids, there is no evidence for the IV fluids. I certainly go through a specific, um, you know, I, I go through all the potential complications and possibilities before advising somebody to have one. I do this on a very small selected group of patients. Um, I will do kind of outpatient IV fluids with a peripheral line. Um, if the patients are having a flare where they're not able to take enough PO, but they're still functional enough that they can present to a infusion center locally just to bridge them over from the poor PO intake and GI symptoms. 
Um, but then in my most impaired patients, I do consider pl placement of a either a pick line or or a, a port in some cases if they're having um, you know basically needs for IV hydration in order to even tolerate upright posture. Um, it's it's um, you know in those cases when their goal is to sit down and dinner um, and they can only do that with IV fluids. Um, you know, as long as they understand the risk. And this, the, the hard thing is that these patients are of reproductive age. So not only do they have a risk of thrombophlebitis or DVTs, they're premenopausal, so they will have increased bleeding during their period. And then all kinds of stuff has happened to me that, that you know, traumatizes you. But but at the end of the day, you know, this is this is a conversation that you have with the patient and they have to be fully in the knowledge of all the the potential risk and just have an open conversation with them. Um, the I think the other ones are for hoppers. Um, there was a question about NG tube with water and salt. I I find that the, the patients have trouble tolerating. Um, if it's like an NG tube, sometimes we have to do NJ and then the NJ is like moves and you have to replace it. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. Um, but, but yeah, typically NG doesn't work that well. hasn't worked that well for me in the patients that I had experience with it. We have to do NJ and, and put the water through like a pump to slow kind of titrate that in. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hoppers, I want to ask you a question. So you touched on the education piece and how important it is around PE in this, this young adult group. How do you do that, right? I mean, naturally, they just want to live. They're kids, they're young adults. What What's your kind of pitch? I well, guess? It, it, again, I try to I, I try to do something kind of different each time. I try to explain, you know, you can and and sometimes you know, I'll start out with maybe, you know, you can take 3 hours worth of work and you can divide it up into pieces and not have to pay that 3 days back or you can do those 3 hours and now you also lose 3 more days. But I'm going to be honest with you, um Really and truly, it's so hard to do a visit. I, again, I like to touch on it, emphasize that I believe it. it you know, this is, it's very important. Um, here's some more resources to do when you get home so they get another view. And then again, I, try, I want to, it, it, I've used a little bit of OT in my clinic. I've had a student that's worked with me and helped because it's, you just don't have the time. But I really think that finding people who are really good at it and having them do it with the patient as well, so that it's like a whole different visit. That's all you're talking about. I think that's really important. And I don't want to, I don't know if I can say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Amy Mooney, use her. Oh, dear Lord, use her. She's incredible. And Clayton's great. I don't know how much you do. I know you do some telehealth, but only in Utah. But you know, these two guys, they, they're so incredible and can do far better than me at explaining anything. And I, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, my daughter had a session with Amy and it was, I was, I mean, it was funny. She came down and she said, mom, you know, you've told me this a hundred times, but when she said it to me, it sunk in better. And I know I'm not my patient's mom, but you know, sometimes just getting a different viewpoint, a different person saying it, because I'm sort of an authority figure to them as well, even though I try to be, you know, friendly and all that. Whereas getting it from someone else, I think is helpful. Just multiple, multiple avenues, just keep kind of just, you know, ad nauseum. Here's, here's the thing. And you have to do that with adults too, right? You know, and, and sometimes these adults are in charge of these kids' lives. And I've had, you know, I have a parent that I went with over and over and over she, I, I see her a lot because she, she's in our clinic, right? And uh, an employee. And, and so I've, I've talked to a lot about it and then I can, I'll be so shocked when they'll say, oh, well, we did this last night, this extra, like we exercised and I'm, you know, and this is a severe patient. And so I'm like, oh, you're, I, I, I'm failing. I'm not getting the message across. So to just keep reiterating and reiterating. Thank you so much. Um, 
Amy Mooney and Clayton Powers have been doing a lot of amazing work. We have a lot of educational resources, both for, I mean, I think it really applies to anyone experiencing long COVID and MECFS, but it's really kind of taking that therapeutic approach and redefining what it means to just simply move and live with these new, this these conditions, these diseases. So uh, we have a lot of that available and they both did a wonderful presentation last month for our ECHO if you missed that. So um, really, really quick, I want to get to one more question. If you have the time, Dr. Hoppers and Azola, this question, you just answered it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Okay. Yes. No. yes. She, she was at a tertiary hospital and it's, it, I have some more theories about what's going on with that because she still has some problems with it. But, no. but I, yeah, I do think it, the thing with the MCAS is then when we put the, the, um, pick line in, and yeah. you had that rash and all of that. I feel like that was an MCAS issue. Yeah. Maybe we can do a follow-up, you know, mm -hmm. in the fall and see how and she's I'm re doing. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm repeating her labs because I found out again, the MCAS labs, right? They live 30 minutes from the clinic. Um, I found out after the fact, I talked to the lab person and I, you know, she said, oh yeah, they brought them back. They were warm <laughs> and they didn't bring them in ice. So, you know, I know why they're negative. Um, so we're going to, we're going to repeat those. I've made it, I've since made a handout for the patient. So <laughs> quick question um, before we finish up. Sorry, I wasn't on earlier I'm in the ICU, which is always a and a fun juggling. But one of the challenges I think we ran into is accommodations, both for school and work. I know, you know, that's been something people have touched on. Anything specifically that you found? Because people will come back to you and say, I brought this, you know, I brought your letter and yada, yada, but I'm still not getting X, Y, and Z that I need. Any ideas for that? I just find that a tough one. I send my resume with them. And I make it sound, I try to make it sound really, really good. And I also send articles from, you know, I, I send articles from the Bateman Horn Center. I send, I, I deluge them with information because I, I've had, I, I had a really particular bad case with a patient where they would not do any of the accommodations. They, I mean, they were, it, it was terrible. And they, I felt like they really harmed this patient with the stress that he was under from the school and how they were treating him. And, but, you know, that's what I did is I, and I offered to go and talk and they didn't care for that, but, but I would, um, and, and, you know, just trying to find someone that you can speak with sometimes is helpful. And it's, and if you start can, to show them that you have knowledge, I think that that's helpful. And again, if you have something that says, you know, the CDC or, you know, baby horn center, you know, <laughs> me, the local, uh, you know, rural doc, they're like, Hey, what do you know? But if you show them something from someone more important than, than they're a little more apt to listen. Yeah. I mean, I deal a lot with the work stuff. I'm more than school because, um, and I find again, supporting data is important, but sometimes, you know, you have to kind of play a game and go, you know, kind of, really there's some templates on the internet i can remember right now i have a few saved that you know have the legal language regarding you know uh, um aca accommodations and uh, like what are reasonable accommodations uh, sometimes they will come back with like a really unreasonable job description that kind of it, it can be it can be pretty tough i i have I get cases where i just go back and forth um again, meeting with a higher ops or, or just continuing to, but the legal language is important too, uh, because then they know that, that, you know, what they're talking, you know, what you're talking about. <laughs> so there are some templates with like the legal verbiage that you need. And I'm, I'm happy to like find those and send them out too. Um, but that, that has been a helpful thing for me because there are laws to protect these people and they are, you know, entitled to have this reasonable accommodations in place. So, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's vocational training, like finding something different that they can do given their impairment, you know, and, and sometimes it comes to that if, if it's a job that they truly cannot fulfill with accommodations. So yeah, it's challenging. Yeah. Thank you. Really great questions. Amy also mentioned in the chat, encouraging families to start a 504 education plan. So 
okay, I don't want to take up any more of your, your precious time today, but as a reminder, we do have a special quarterly echo, which will occur on January 18th, same time, 12 o'clock. We will be joined by Dr. Petra Kleinig and Teresa Dowell. Uh, they will be talking about tethered cord syndrome and aspects of neuroinflammation. So we hope to see you all there. Have a good rest of your day.